Hello, I'm Professor Kozlowski. Welcome to my course webpage at George Mason University. Today we'll be looking at a case study report, an article I've written. Uh, click the link to my archive, articles I've <clears throat> written on a monthly basis for Parks and Recreation Magazine since January of 1982. In this particular session, we'll be looking at the July 2012 article entitled Supervision Faulting in City Camping Trip Fatality. And this involves the case of Chavez versus Santa Fe Springs. It's a California appellate court. It was issued December 9th of 2011. In this case, uh, John Chavez, who was 16 and a half at the time, died from head injuries he sustained when he slipped and fell over a waterfall during a city-sponsored camping trip. And the wrongful death claim, Chavez's mother alleged that the negligence of the city uh, caused her son's fall. In particular, as we'll see, negligent supervision. So this case study will give you some insights with 2020 hindsight, how perhaps the uh, supervision could be have been improved in this particular situation. Uh, the trial court, however, dismissed Chavez's case based upon a waiver or liability release signed by both the mother and son. Ms. Chavez challenged the validity and forcibility of this liability release. Uh, specifically, she contended that uh, the form would not release the city from liability for gross negligence. And generally, where a waiver or release is valid and enforceable, it will release from liability for ordinary negligence, but not gross negligence. And in this report, we'll see a distinction between the two. Keep it in mind, however, it's a minority view here in Virginia, but based on the Virginia State Supreme Court opinion from 1992 uh, involving Hyatt versus Lake Barcroft, uh, such waivers and releases are deemed void as against public policy. That would only be the case in Virginia, um, but it is a minority view uh, in that situation. But here we'll see in California, uh, they will hold such agreements valid and forcible under certain circumstances, but it may not extend to allegations of gross negligence. And we'll see here whether there was indeed evidence of gross negligence on the part of the city in connection with the supervision during this camping trip. Uh, Ms. Chavez also alleged that she'd been fraudulently induced uh, to sign the liability release because she'd been told that the field trip would be supervised at all times. And in fact, it wasn't. And these waivers and releases are effectively contracts in which you give up something to get something. Here, the plaintiffs, Chavez is giving up any claims she may have for ordinary negligence in exchange for the opportunity for her son to participate in the field trip but her understanding was that it would be a supervised field trip. And in fact, if it wasn't, uh, this would fail on a contract basis because she didn't get her part of the bargain, if you will. So let's look at the facts of the case. Uh, here the city took 20 more high school students on a five-day sponsored trip to a state park, Mount Whitney, in the High Sierras is the highest mountain outside of Alaska. And keep in mind, uh, these are suburban, urban kids who are not familiar with this kind of environment. And as a result, um, it's much more hazardous, perhaps, and may indeed uh, reasonable care under the circumstances, as we'll see, would require greater supervision than you would have in a more familiar environment close to home. 
prior to the treat pre-trip meeting, parents' questions were answered uh, and concerns of safety. And here's a key point. They were assured that the teens would be supervised at all times during the trip. And as we'll see, they weren't. Uh, the city fed transported the members. Uh, there were city staff and some law enforcement personnel city who acted as chaperones. Uh, point based on preparing these participants on a trip into the great outdoors, perhaps their first experience in the great outdoors, that none of the participants were required to have any wilderness or camping experience, nor any evidence that they did. And there was no evidence that such preparation was provided. Moreover, none of the staff members, city staff members, had any special training regarding camping or hiking. So were they reasonably prepared, qualified to lead a trip into the high Sierras with a bunch of teenagers? And you can see it's uh, sort of a tragedy of errors here that's that's adding up a number of factors uh, some st city staff members had been on previous trips to this area and they were aware of this waterfall that was about a mile from the campsite uh, and the risks that someone might fall and in fact that's what happened to Chavez in this fatal accident uh, once again for the field trip and planning it, no determination was made of the participants' outdoor experience or no discussion of the type of equipment they needed um, and this risks that might be encountered around the waterfall or no evidence of safety guidelines imposed on the campers or precautions that should be taken in light of risk. The general duties that an instructor would owe a participant are proper instruction. What kind of instruction? Well, what's the necessary safety instruction that the participants need in order to look out reasonably for their own safety? There's some evidence here that that sort of information was lacking. As I said, Decedent Chavez was 16 and a half years old at the time. And for the trip, he and his mother had signed a release form. Now, since he's 16 and a half, he's under 18. He doesn't have the legal capacity to enter into a contract, which is what a liability release form is. Uh, that's not an issue in this particular case, but it does appear in a number of other cases. Moreover, traditionally, uh, parents did not have the right to sign away the uh, rights of their children. Uh, I wrote an article earlier on these parental child waivers and their validity and forcibility, but that's not an issue in this particular case. Uh, the language of the Release is cited here. It's you know, your basic uh, legal gobbledygook. Uh, but a waiver release, one of its elements to make it more effective, it's an express assumption of risk. And to a certain degree, its, it's effectiveness is correlated to an expressed assumption of risk what types of risks are expressed so you know what you're getting yourself into and then on balance it may be your fault that you know those risks and accordingly assume them here you'll see there's not quite a you know, there's no idea any specific risks risk information uh, there's no indication of the risks that you would uh, be facing in the high Sierras. It just may you may be exposed to some risk of personal injury or death, right? That leaves a lot to the imagination. In fact, 
generally even without a written document, a participant assumes the open and obvious inherent risks in any activity. So for example, in football, it's a contact sport, you're gonna get knocked around. So if you're really going to put risk information in such a document, whether it's valid or enforceable or not, uh, is it any evidence of the risks that were assumed by the participant because they were spelled out? Here, there's no such descriptive risk information. So, I mentioned you, you discharge any and all claims that you may have against the city. Um, as a general rule, as we'll see, courts will read that even it doesn't specify, you really would not forego any and all claims, only those claims which you would give up in a valid enforceable waiver or liability release, and that would be claims based on ordinary negligence, but not gross negligence. So continuing on with the facts, Chavez attended the mandatory pre-trip meeting. Uh, once again, at the meeting, parents were assured that the children would be supervised at all times. Uh, and their trip's itinerary was not shared with the parents give them any heads up as to uh, what type of great outdoors experience these teens would be facing in the high Sierras. Moreover, and more importantly, they were not advised that included in the itinerary was planned free time, which teens were not supervised by the staff, which runs totally counter to the assurances given the parents that they would be supervised at all times and was a part of the deal, if you will, in signing the release. And in fact, they were permitted and even encouraged to explore the surrounding area as long as they not go alone and told a staff member where they were going. So even in terms of a reasonable parent, if you have teens and you're out in the high Sierras and it's their first experience out there, I doubt if you'd tell two of the kids, hey, go together and just, uh, go wherever you will, um, generally that would be considered unreasonable, whether it's parental supervision and certainly supervision of this particular field trip. Uh, because of the high risk nature of the environment and that it's unfamiliar with the part of the participants and moreover, they've not been provided any sort of preparation or training before they go out into the high Sierras. So the city <clears throat> was not able to offer any evidence that in fact the parents were advised of these facts. So during this free time situation, uh, John and several campers received permission to hike to a nearby stream and waterfall. We saw a reference earlier that some of the staff were aware of that this was a high risk situation. So the city and their agents should have known where as the teenager participants wouldn't be expected to know. And where you have that imbalance of risk knowledge or information, that's where liability is more likely. Further, they were not told not to climb, or go above or near the waterfall. So since they were said free time, go where you will, uh, at their age, perhaps they could have thought their lack of experience, maybe it was still okay. So they left the trail, they went to the waterfall. Uh, two boys proceeded to climb on the wet, wet rocks in the stream. Some of them didn't wanna go further. Um, John is apparently, and given his age, it's understandable, uh, was more of a risk taker. And despite others' admonitions to stop, uh, he continued on. He was out of sight, but apparently he went over the rocks uh, and was found at the bottom of the stream 
uh, and eventually died as a result of his injuries. So Chavez sued the city on behalf of herself and her son's estate. And once again, the city moved for summary judgment to dismiss the case based on that release the mother and the son had signed. Chavez claimed once again that in release was unenforceable because here any and all claims would have precluded not only ordinary negligence but liability for gross negligence. So it's against public policy to allow people to cut contracts which effectively say not only is it okay that you can be careless i.e. ordinary negligence but it's okay for you to be grossly negligent. As we'll see, uh, misconduct that's tantamount to an intent to injure or an utter disregard for physical well-being of others. Courts under public policy uh, usually are not going to enforce those sorts of agreements. So generally, even a valid enforceable release will preclude claims for ordinary negligence, but not gross negligence. So the issue is whether there's sufficient evidence, as we'll see here, to establish such gross negligence. So Chavez appeals, and the first issue we outlined was the validity of the liability release. And the court notes standards which releases are judged are well established. Courts don't like these things. They would rather you be careful, exercise reasonable care under the circumstance, and not cut contracts that effectively say it's okay for you to be negligent in exchange for an opportunity to participate. But looking at freedom of contract, particularly among adults, courts reluctantly will uphold these, but they're strictly construed against the defendant. Any doubt goes in favor of the injured plaintiff. And although a release need not be perfect, it should constitute a clear, unequivocal waiver with specific reference to a defendant's negligence, which, as we'll see, um, the type of risks that you were to encounter, and the risk here was a failure to supervise, certainly nothing was clear and unequivocal expressed in what's type of risks are you accepting in that document signed by the mother and son uh, over and above risks that you would already assume uh, from the inherent open and obvious risk associated with a given activity, which participants assume just by their mere participation without the necessity of even having to sign a document. So the court here, unlike the Supreme Court of Virginia, said in the absence of circumstance involving a public interest where this contract would not be upheld, they acknowledged that the law in California and other jurisdictions, in fact, would allow people to contract away any future liability for point being ordinary negligence generally not gross negligence. And the court acknowledged, and there's a trend in this area, where there in fact is a public interest to encourage such agreements, particularly where they involve uh, youth with recreational opportunities uh, to protect volunteer groups, uh, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, the sports leagues and the like. And in fact, um, because they're more effective than these waiver contracts, many jurisdictions have passed volunteer immunity statutes, which provide limited immunity to the individuals, not necessarily the association, but like a valid enforceable waiver, you won't be liable, liable for ordinary negligence, you'd only be liable for gross negligence. So let's look at the distinction the court makes between ordinary negligence, where the waiver might be valid and enforceable, waiving those types of claims, but not 
where the court acknowledged there may be a policy to provide immunity, particularly in this youth sports area for ordinary negligence, but there's no policy that would favor and allow people off the hook for gross negligence, utter disregard, outrageous misconduct. We may cut you some slack for mere carelessness, but uh, there's no advantage of providing public recreational opportunities to youth where we'd be exposing them to gross negligence, a complete failure to exercise any level of reasonable care. So the idea that policy concerns where the fear of liability would eliminate youth recreational opportunities, uh, so we favor cutting some slack to those groups for ordinary negligence, there's no such public policy interest in letting them walk away from any and all liability, including gross negligence. And that in fact, the court found in other jurisdictions where liability release agreements are upheld, but will not allow immunity from gross negligence, uh, that hasn't resulted in a wholesale elimination of youth recreation opportunities. So let's distinguish, as the court does here, between ordinary negligence and gross negligence. So ordinary negligence is a failure to exercise that care of a reasonable person under the circumstances. Gross negligence is not where your lack of reasonable care or care less, but it's effectively, I could care less, that it its conduct would exhibits either a want or even scant care, and unlike lack of care, you act as the unreasonable person. Here, it's such a matter of degree that it's something entirely different. There's an extreme departure from ordinary standard of the reasonable person, uh, reasonable care, where it enters into the realm of uh, reckless or outrageous and will determine what constitutes ordinary negligence, reasonable care, or gross negligence from the perspective of the reasonable person here. And I already stated the reasonable parent taking kids out into their first outdoor experience. <laughs> Would it be reasonable or perhaps careless, ordinary negligence, or outrageous under the circumstances, i.e. gross negligence, to effectively give these teenagers carte blanche during free time. Hey, as long as you're with somebody, go out and explore wherever, knowing that waterfalls out there. And the court noted the distinction between ordinary negligence, and gross negligence, um, that harsher legal consequences should flow where you're guilty of aggravated misconduct, gross negligence under the circumstances. So the court generally following the rule in most jurisdictions, here's a good rule to keep in mind, a release agreement to the extent it purports to release liability for gross negligence violates public policy and is unenforceable. Here, as we mentioned on appeal, Chavez maintains the trial court erred in dismissing her claims based on the liability release because here there is evidence Chavez claimed of gross negligence. So what sort of conduct would constitute gross negligence in general and under the facts of this particular case? So had Chavez alleged sufficient facts by which a jury could find that the city's conduct here constituted gross negligence and therefore even with a valid enforceable waiver, they would still be liable. And here in the opinion of the court, based upon the facts on the record, 
a jury could indeed find that there was more than just a momentary lapse of judgment, carelessness that would constitute ordinary negligence, that the facts here, a jury could reasonably find that there was indeed gross negligence. That here encouraging campers to undertake potentially hazardous activities, exploring the surrounding terrain in the waterfall, without ever taking even minimal precautions of planning and, and for the exposure of adolescent campers, these aren't experienced outdoorsmen, uh, where their youth expected enthusiasm, uh, adult supervisors would expect them maybe to do stupid things in an unfamiliar and untamed environment as we have here in the high Sierras. And children generally are held to the standard of a child of reasonable, similar age education and experience until they reach 18. So seven and under, they're unable to look out reasonably for their own safety in general terms. And traditionally seven to 14, the same presumption applies, but you can rebut it and say, well, this kid should have known better. 14 to 18, <coughs> the assumption shifts and presumes that perhaps they can look out reasonably for their own safety like the reasonable adult, but it all depends. And here, the facts, <coughs> given the environment here, that unlike adults, these adolescents under these circumstances, as we'll see, might not be expected to exhibit the degree of discretion, judgment, concern that you would expect if you took a bunch of adults out there. And they said, you know, you can't close your eyes to the fact as a supervisor that boys, teenage boys are risk takers. They want to impress their friends, show off, and they're going to do some stupid things and that they won't exercise the same amount of care looking out for their own safety as an adult would. So dealing with this reality of a bunch of boy teenagers, court mentions their outside competitiveness and bravado, <coughs> that even um, one isolated deviation could not only constitute negligence, but here, given the risks involved, that it could constitute gross negligence under the circumstances. So they stress here this unfamiliar environment, looks beautiful, but it's more hazardous than it appears. And this was their first outdoor opportunity for youth from an urban setting. That as a result, this somewhat benign outdoor environment when the city supervisors knew or should have known actually posed extraordinary danger and hazards to the teenage boys including John such that given these facts a jury could find that had there been more thorough and planning and closer supervision that was appropriate or required under such circumstances that it would have reduced the acceptable levels of risk of, as happened here, death to one of the campers. And the lack of any such <coughs> appropriate planning or supervision, as we'll see, provided evidence by which a jury could find for gross negligence. So here, jury could find that failure to exercise due care in implementing a well-conceived plan, preparing these teenagers to go out into the great outdoors and their first you know, wilderness or outdoors experience, uh, that the city failed to consider or even recognize the potentially face the campers' safety and well-being that they were undertaking to protect 
that this perhaps went way beyond mere carelessness, ordinary negligence, that it could indeed constitute that entire want of care, utter disregard uh, that would establish gross negligence, which even a valid enforceable waiver wouldn't be effective to preclude liability for gross negligence. So the city failed to formulate any plan about how to meet and address those risks. They failed to implement appropriate supervision, education, discussions, admonitions, or any other means to protect the campers from obvious dangers. Now you might say, well, generally there's no duty to provide protection against an obvious danger but here, under the circumstances, particularly given the fact that it was billed as a supervised field trip where we would all see the same waterfall, it's not the physical obviousness, but to what extent under the circumstances, particularly for these urban youth on their first outdoor trip, to what extent was the degree level of risk obvious, such that they should have been able, even without this training and preparation, to recognize and guard themselves against those dangers. And I think uh, a jury might say, well, hey, these kids from these circumstances at teenagers, they wouldn't be expected to be able to know, appreciate, and avoid these kinds of dangers without better preparation and supervision. So as the court notes here, there were programmatic failures all the way around. With 2020 hindsight, uh, gives you some insight into what you would do differently, as opposed to thinking, well, just have them sign a waiver, waiving liability for any and all claims signed by both the parent and the child participant, ignoring the fact that kids can't sign contracts generally. Uh, and then you're, quote, covered. Uh, it would have been time better spent in terms of preparing not only the participants but the parents uh, for what sorts of risks they would be encountered and making them better prepared to handle those risks, either through better supervision and or better preparation. So once again, gross negligence here would require an extreme departure from the standard of care. Now, reasonable care, reasonable supervision, you're not required to monitor every move, every moment. That would be unreasonable. That would require one-to-one -one supervision. And only reasonable supervision is required. But here, as opposed to watching them every minute, they were effectively let loose on their own during this free time. And in many activities, that's usually the danger. You may have a well-run, for example, PE class or sport, and you have a few minutes left, so you say, hey, there's some free time, just kind of do your thing. Well, that's sometimes a recipe for disaster. So here the court found the... Uh, following programmatic failures that could transfer what might be considered mere carelessness, but if you add it all up, it would transform from mere ordinary negligence carelessness to one of even scant care or an extreme departure that would constitute gross negligence. So there was no requirement of adult supervision during excursions to areas of known danger. Staff had some knowledge that the participants did not have regarding this waterfall and the slippery rocks and even mentioned that somebody had died before at this particular site. There were no rules, warnings, admonitions on how to approach these dangerous areas. And depending on the age, you can warn and have all the rules you want. You can't assume that they're going to follow them. The young, certainly the younger they get, 
are less experienced, you have to make up for that in terms of a shorter leash, better supervision. There was no staff training or staff awareness to, to prepare the staff in order to prepare the participants. That was totally lacking. Not only the fact that some staff had been on previous trips. There was no education or advice discussion that the staff had been trained to provide the campers about these dangers. Furthermore, there were no discussion of these dangers with the campers' parents where they might say, hey, uh, I don't think I want my kid to, to go out there. Parents were simply told they would be supervised at all times when in fact they weren't, which the question being therefore, by saying they were to be supervised at all times, was supervision misrepresented? Was that a fraudulent inducement for Chavez to sign the, what we've already found to be a perhaps invalid release given the evidence of gross negligence, but that that been the factor that prompted her to agree to this. I'll let my kid go to have that opportunity. In exchange, I'll give up any claims I may, hey, may have for ordinary negligence with the understanding that he would be supervised at all times. So that's her argument here. So in addition, where a waiver will be invalid if there's gross negligence, it can also be invalidated on the second issue raised by Chavez, if the contract agreement, if you will, has been one induced by fraudulent misrepresentations to sign the agreement. If so, then the party here, Chavez, would be entitled to have it set aside. She was told, she says, fraudulently, that the kids would be supervised at all times, where the city knew about this free time circumstances, which really uh, started the ball rolling for the fatal accident. So the city's liability release would be unenforceable if Chavez could prove she was induced to sign it by this misrepresentation of material facts regarding the level of supervision. She was told they would be supervised at all times when in fact they weren't. So once again, the court as they had found there may have been sufficient evidence for a jury to find gross negligence. Similarly, there was sufficient evidence for a jury to find that the mom here was induced to sign the liability release by the city staff's misrepresentations that they would be supervised at all times knowing they wouldn't be. They already knew about this free time aspect of the trip. So a jury's persuaded that the trip's itinerary, the level of supervision was misrepresented, then they could find that the release had been fraudulently induced and that it would not be enforceable against Chavez. So there's two bases for this waiver to be shot down, found unenforceable, even in a jurisdiction where might they might find it valid enforceable, particularly where it's providing recreational opportunities to youths as a matter of public policy, but it would not be public policy to allow such agreements where there's gross negligence and on just basic contract principles to allow such a contract uh, <clears throat> that was entered into, you agreed to the city's terms, uh, but they were misrepresented, which fraudulently induced your agreement. So the conclusion of the case in this particular instance, that rather than letting the trial court's order stand, recalling that the claim was dismissed based on the Liability release, which the appeals court here found on two bases, a jury could find that it was invalid. Chavez would get her day in court. Summary judgments reversed. 
her claims allowed to proceed to trial. And at trial, a jury would indeed consider the enforceability of the release of the city's liability for negligence. And the other issue, whether this representation of supervision at all times had fraudulently induced the agreement. And if they find either on one basis or the other, they voided the particular release, found it unenforceable, then they would consider Chavez's original complaint as you'll recall, she claimed the city was negligent, city's negligence, in particular the supervision, led to her son's fatal fall. And the waiver was raised as a defense to ordinary negligence. So if the waiver shot down, then she gets her day in court and she can establish liability just on ordinary negligence basis particularly whether there was unreasonable supervision under the circumstances of this case. So that concludes our overview of this particular case study. And again, hopefully with 2020 hindsight, uh, you can learn from the shortcomings of the city of Santa Fe Springs in dealing with a field trip to unfamiliar environment particularly with teenagers uh, who, given their age, education, and experience, uh, more likely, particularly in an unfamiliar environment, uh, to take unnecessary risks. And those concerns need to be addressed. So this is Professor Kozlowski, and we'll see you next time with another uh, case report.